That's essentially what happens when the contents of the stomach and the duodenum come up uh, into the esophagus. They're not controlled at the upper esophagus, uh, and then they can spill over. Um, now that, when it spills over, you've got two main groups of structures around there. You've got your lungs and your trachea, and you have your pharynx swallowing mechanism, vocal cord, the two main groups. So the pharynx and uh, the airways. And uh, if you're washing your vocal cords in the contents of your stomach and uh, duodenum on a regular basis, then they will become effective. And they become inflamed. Uh, you can get nodules. You can get all kinds of side effects from this, direct consequences. Uh, and uh, that affects the voice and the quality of the voice and the strength of the voice. So in terms of the tone, projection, and so on. Like a lot of things uh, in medicine, in health, in nature, uh, an occasional uh, insult or injury um, is recoverable. Uh, it is reversible. You can recover from that. Uh, however, if you have that same injury repeated, repeated uh, persistently over time, doesn't have to be a huge amount of time uh, repeated, then the changes can become irreversible. And that's exactly what happens with reflux, uh, what it does to the esophagus, what it does to the vocal cords, what it can do to the airways and the lungs. Uh, once or twice transient, I guess they're warning uh, symptoms. Uh, repeatedly, recurrently, the, the symptoms might actually diminish with time. They might become less noticeable as, as you learn to live with them. But the changes that they lead to can then become permanent. So once you're getting uh, the vocal cords washed in the refluxate, the contents of the stomach and the duodenum, uh, you start experiencing this, the manifestations of that. And those are voice loss, uh, throat clearing, hoarseness, difficulty in projecting your voice, difficulty in talking for long periods. And I've had many patients who come to me with these as their primary symptoms. I've had uh, people who work in radio, I've had uh, people who are performers or singers or speakers and, and teachers and so on, where they actually cannot any longer deliver the day-to-day -day -day work. Um, I had a gentleman, he worked on a very loud, busy building site. He was unable to project and shout. So sometimes the voice loss is the first presentation. Uh, once you've got that, you've got your clinical history, it's really important to get uh, the diagnosis. Clearly, but once you've got your diagnosis, it's equally important if you're heading down the treatment plan to know that your diagnosis of reflux is the cause of those symptoms. So sometimes you can have symptoms which aren't directly down to the reflux, or sometimes you can have symptoms down to the reflux, but there might be a coexisting disease. So I do spend some time with the ENT surgeons, my colleagues work quite closely with them, where if primarily the patient patients' problems are in the throat, we also get their throats looked at and assessed uh, by our colleagues. So you rule out coexisting diseases, you confirm the diagnosis of reflux, and there are tools that we use to actually link in that diagnosis of reflux uh, symptom uh, association probability with the uh, symptoms that they have. Once we know that, then the patient has several options essentially conservative we always think about medical we always think about and surgical options and pretty much most of the things that i treat in surgery most of the things we do in medicine you always want to take the option which is going to be effective lowest risk and i think that's the crunch is is medical treatment effective yes it might relieve symptoms but no it will not stop the fluid still coming up. Uh, in many instances, it doesn't pre prevent the progression of the disease from something that's reversible to something that's irreversible. So generally, if people have a confirmed diagnosis, they're symptomatic, if they're relatively active and fit enough uh, for a procedure, uh, we then do a risk-benefit uh, analysis. We see, is the surgery going to benefit them? Almost certainly it will. Uh, we then see what the risks are for them. And if patients are generally low risk, 
then it's a relatively straightforward algorithm going down that surgical route. So the decision making is based on a case by case basis. It's arrived at after some basic investigations, history, uh, and examination, and uh, then correlating those findings with the patient's symptoms. So we, we've talked a little bit about how the voice gets affected. I find that actually in practice, uh, we get a group of patients who come with just voice symptoms. We get a group of patients who come just with lung symptoms. And we come, get a large group of patients who come with both together. So just as the reflux state can go up into the upper esophagus, beyond the pharynx, into the trachea and the, and the lungs, uh, just the same way that it can affect the pharynx and the vocal cords. You get uh, aspiration as a direct result of this. It goes into the lungs, and if you get large amounts of aspiration, possibly even with food, then this can lead to recurrent pneumonia and recurrent infection. More insidious, more worrying than that, uh, and I'm uh, glad that this has finally been picked up. I, uh, it's something which I've been looking at for the last two decades, but there is now greater awareness. More worrying than that is pulmonary fibrosis and chronic gradual worsening of lung function. And this is something which you know people might not immediately notice, but they will get more short of breath. They will get weaker. Their exercise function goes down. And again, if someone's got uh, respiratory symptoms getting worse in the presence of reflux, uh, then that needs treatment. It needs effective treatment. Now, the problem is, awareness. Uh, we could say maybe a couple of decades ago, there was much less awareness and there were patients sitting in chest clinics with very large hiatus hernias or with very wide open sphincters with bad reflux, but just getting treatment for their cough. And gradually this message has now gone out. More and more people are aware. And in fact, some of our respiratory physicians have embraced this. And I, I do get regular referrals now from chest physicians whose patients have a chronic cough, they've investigated them, they've identified that they respond to acid medication, which is suggesting that it's down to an increased acid in the throat, acid in the trachea problem, and they refer me for definitive treatment. And I'm really actually pleased to say, you know, I've got a couple of colleagues where this is at the early part of their treatment. It's not after eight years, 10 years, or several years of lingering in a clinic. They've been with them for two months, They've seen that the, there is no other pathology to account for the chest problems. They've got symptoms of reflux. They respond to the medication. They send them to me for definitive treatment with surgery. And uh, uh, that's, it's encouraging. Uh, there's still more work to do. I think general awareness is still not there. So voice and pulmonary problems as a direct consequence of reflux is not fully appreciated everywhere but it's getting there. One of the key examples, for example, is you don't have to have heartburn. Many patients with bad reflux don't have heartburn. They just get the stuff coming up. Their first manifestation, their first presentation might be voice loss. Uh, it might be their only presentation. Uh, a first manifestation might be repeated chest infections or even worse, abscesses in the lungs and so on. Um, and as I mentioned, those who present chronically uh, are the most worrying because those changes are irreversible. With any form of treatment and specific treatment, very, very important to get the diagnosis right. Very important to make sure there are no other diseases going on that are causing it. And very important to make sure that the diagnosis is the cause of the symptoms uh, at and is, is therefore justified in, in treating that as a primary treatment. In reflux in general, patients uh, have, usually by the time they come to me, they've tried medical treatment, uh, they've tried conservative measures, they've tried lifestyle changes. Uh, no matter how much you improve your lifestyle, it's great, improves your general health. It, it's not going to get a large hiatus hernia or moderate hiatus hernia to go away. That's an anatomical disruption that won't change. Yes, I do like patients to lose weight. I do like them to give up smoking and reduce alcohol intake and eat more healthy. I, I take the whole holistic approach. And at the end of it, I want a healthy patient. Uh, it's very, very important. And that's part of it. But is it going to make the reflux go away enough 
to take away the damage to the lungs, take away damage to the cords? Probably not. And again, that damage to the lungs and the cord, that, that's what worries me. These are actually my red lines. These are my triggers for uh, recommending definitive treatment because they, they have serious consequences for long-term health. Uh, they are reversible early on. They become irreversible later on. And so you need definitive management. Now, in terms of surgery, I'm a surgeon, so I'll tell you a bit about that. But generally, the surgery is about bringing the stomach back into the abdomen and then creating a barrier at the top end of the stomach. And traditionally, we've done this by either stitching the stomach. So I've done well over a thousand of those operations, very, very, very low complication rate, uh, generally very good results, over 90 percent of patients come off medication and most of those remain off medication uh, with symptom improvement uh, and I've done uh, variations of this probably another thousand or variations of this repairing the hiatus hernia all kinds of combinations and some of those have been the links operation which we started doing uh, about 11 years ago they all involve creating a barrier of some sort a ring usually around the esophagus of some sort, whether it's the stomach itself or titanium device and so on. And the two side effects with that op, which I warn every single patient about, they tend to be transient. Uh, they are much less uh, problematic when you have a regular team doing it, but still I warn people and they are difficult in swallowing. Food can catch and the risk of bloating. Now the problem with difficulty in swallowing is you're creating a mechanical barrier. You want it to be sufficiently strong to prevent stuff coming back up into your esophagus, lungs, and throat. If it's too strong and too tight, then food uh, will not go down so easily, and things that can catch your bread and meat and so on. Now, a new thing has come along, and uh, this is the reflux stop, and it's an implantable device, and it's taken a few principles, and it's quite clever, actually. It's the first device uh, that's put... A, there around, around the esophagus, along the esophagus, that actually doesn't have to encircle the esophagus. So we've had rings, we've got the links, which again is, is outstanding in terms of standardizing care and making the operation much simpler. But this new device uh, has one main advantage over those, and that is the risk of dysphagia is much, much less because it does not, not encircle the esophagus. So this is uh, the approach is exactly the same. You go in through uh, five holes, a, a keyhole uh, approach into the abdomen to bring the stomach into its position. That all has to be done. You're then stitching the stomach together at the top end of uh, the stomach at the lower end of the esophagus. And then this device is almost invaginated into the stomach and, and a little pocket is created and it's left there. And what it does is it reinforces what you've done with your stitching is almost like a stop preventing the stomach going back up. Therefore, it's called reflux stop. And it's a new device. It's something which we've been very, very selective in applying, uh, but it definitely has applications. And in fact, the patients I'm doing this mainly on now are going to be and will be and have been the patients who have weak motility, weak contractions of the esophagus where they're at higher risk of dysphagia. Um, and this obviously we're offering alongside the links and the hiatus hernias and all the other traditional operations which uh, I've been doing since 2001. So it'll be very interesting to, to see the longer term results. That is as always uh, one of the drawbacks with brand new things is uh, your results tend to be shorter term. But the last decade, uh, the, the trials that have been done have been promising on this. Um, and it's been proven safe and has approval and is now in the UK and uh, has approval in the UK as well.